Chuck Hitchborn, one of my favorite Korean War stories. I love this man. He's been one of the guys I've stayed in touch with. I interviewed Chuck June 26, 2008 in Independence, Missouri. He was with the 5th Marines, 2nd Battalion, and uh, he has a great, incredible story to tell about the Korean War, the Forgotten War, and uh, 1950 to 1953. So, without further ado, I introduce you to Chuck Hitchborn and sit back and, and enjoy the sights and sounds of Korea through his eyes and his ears. God bless you. To 1948. 48. How old were you then? I was 17. Okay. And where did you go to basic training? MCRD? MCRD in San Diego and then from there to Camp Pendleton mm -hmm. and was uh, attached to the 5th Marines, 2nd Battalion, a weapons company and uh, was there in training and maneuvers and everything until one day they fell us out and said we were going down and have a dress blue parade down on the parade field. And we put our blues on, marched down Rattlesnake Canyon, and while we were all standing out there in formation, the general says, boys, get your sea bags packed, you're going to Korea. And I thought, where in the world is Korea? <laughs> you know, we just, we didn't know where it was. But that was, this would have been in June, uh, latter part of June, the very first part of July of 1950. So shortly, in a few days, we packed up and they hauled us down to San Diego. We boarded ships. Now this was known as the 1st Provincial Marine Brigade. We went over ahead of the division. And the division didn't meet up with us until we made the Incheon invasion on September 15th. So at this time, when it took us 20 some days, I guess, uh, going across to get to Korea, and we landed at the port of Pusan. And from there, we jumped on a little train that had been all shot up, and they hauled us up to a village called Shangwon, which was approximately 30 miles north and west of, of Pusan. Pusan is a harbor city on the south end of Korea. Korea resembles a peninsula about like the state of Florida. And they, it was 30 to 35 miles to the front anywhere from Pusan. That's how much land they had lost. The North Koreans, when they came across, they came across with such force that the American troops were there just, just couldn't hold them back. They weren't prepared for that kind of a, an assault. And so our first battles were trying to isolate that perimeter and create a defensive line to where we could start doing some maneuvering and move back. And then, of course, as you know, the, the Incheon invasion was a, a brilliant thing on the part of MacArthur, although I wasn't the greatest fan of the guy, but that was brilliant to go around to the other side of the island and land behind the lines and cut them off. And then from there, after we recaptured Kemp Airfield and retook Sewell, we went back to Incheon, boarded ships, went back around over on the west side and went up the coast to Wonsan and disembarked. And that was where we led up into the reservoir. Korea went on, I guess, till 1953. I was out of there right after the reservoir. I, I, I got, the very first morning up the front, I got hit. Uh, just minor wounds from shrapnel. That was on August 7th, 1950, out in that little village at Shangwon. And then from there, we fought two major engagements at the Battle of the Naktong, near, near a village of Yongsan. And it was just kind of a seesaw thing back and forth. Go here and put this fire out. Go over here and have another firefight. And, then all of a sudden at night we were relieved during darkness and kind of pulled out and kept kind of secretive and they pulled us back. That's when we boarded ship and took off for the Incheon invasion. And of course we didn't know where we were going. We were all just young kids. I guess I was, I was 19 then. I'd been in the Corps about two years and been through a lot of training and all of our officers and NCOs were World War II vets and we looked up to them like you know, they, that, that's what saved us really up in the reservoir was good leadership and the, the, the basics that they had taught us. 
my gunnery sergeant had been through seven campaigns in the Pacific, and he sat down on the side of my hole one night with big tears rolling down his cheeks, and boy, that, he said, I've seen a lot of stuff, but I've never seen nothing like this. We all knew it was bad. We just too young to really realize how bad it was. And so after uh, going up through the reservoir, we began to hit the uh, Chinese troops like your films have, have pointed out, and they came across, and I've never seen so many people in my life coming. And fortunately, they didn't have air power. If they'd had air, we'd, none of us would have got out of there. We weren't thoroughly reinforced, and we were going up a little old mountain road, and, and 10th Corps wanted us to go all the way to the Alu River. They had all the high ground, and consequently when they hit, there were six or eight divisions. I think all the history books I've read said there were eight Chinese divisions committed. There's roughly 20,000 men to a Chinese division. Six of those divisions were decimated or annihilated so badly that you never heard of them again. One of them was kind of a reserve supply unit. It was never put back into combat. And the history books also, the commanding, one of their Chinese generals was named Ping, and he committed suicide. He felt so bad about the thing. And I'd heard all these stories about, from our leaders, about the Banzai attacks and Iwo and Kwajalein and Guadalcanal and some of them where you know, the young Marines like I was at that time listened to those stories that they told and we thought, you know, that was true. First band I, bands I charge I heard was down at Kempo Airfield. And my old gunny come running by and he said, hey, don't worry, this is, this is what you want. When they get, when they come charging up like that, they're just throwing all caution to the wind. So just stay in position and you'll, you'll be able to spot them as they come. So the reservoir was an entirely different thing. It was just mass tactics. Uh, just I, I FO'd for a mortar company at that that night of November 27, 1950. They sent me up to Easy Company. It was up on a draw called Easy Alley, and two draws came up the side through the snow, and the the uh, platoon commander wanted me to have 81 mortars fire illumination, so when we heard all the bugles and whistles and everything. And I called and had one of the guns drop a couple of rounds of illumination and they popped. And when those rounds popped, to me, the hills looked like they were working. It looked like, like a bunch of maggots in a carcass. That whole hillside was alive with people coming up. And they were, you know, just being mowed down like, like wheat and Climbing right over the ones that were coming and just kept coming. And I've never seen so many Chinese in my life. And then all of a sudden, somebody would toot a bugle or blow a whistle and a bunch of screaming and yelling, and they'd all pull back. And then maybe another hour or so, here they would come again. And you spent what time between those assaults and trying to take care of your own wood, uh, wounded and, and KIAs and and reconsolidate your own positions. And the bitter cold and the winds, well, subsequently, uh, General Smith, I think you're familiar with his remarks, we are supplied, this road was only wide enough to run a six by truck. And just to make a, to turn a truck around, you practically have to go from ditch to ditch. And nothing but mountains around you and that was our supply line. And we were so far extended where they punched through way back behind us down around Hankaroo, we had no supply. So nearly all of our uh, ammunition, medicine, uh, chow rations were dropped into us by, by air. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the parachutes, the wind and snow would be blowing, they'd blow away from the drop zone. A lot of them went over to the Chinese, but we'd run out and gather what we could. So we had to turn around and fight back to reopen the, the road for the supply line. And that was when General Smith made his statement. You know, so the, the press was talking, well, isn't this a retreat? And, and General Smith said, retreat, hell, we're just fighting in a new direction. And he was absolutely right. We just, it was a battle all the way back out of there. And we were up in there like 28 miles, extended clear out in a string. And, 
There was just no way to, you know, it was an entirely different type of warfare than they had fought before. So we, we'd load up, we'd bury our dead at night, mark them on our maps, and dig them up the next day when you move through them, and they're, they're, they, uh, they were just stiff as boards. And the weather was so cold, you know, 25, 35 below zero, and uh, the, the fighting Mother Nature was as bad as fighting the enemy, and we didn't have the equipment we really needed before the prior to. The Chosen Reservoir, everything I've read and studied in military history, about the closest that came to that was the Battle of the Bulge. And that was in December and back in 43, 44. And it was very, very cold. But it, it wasn't, even though those guys were surrounded there around Bastogne and, and in that area, it, it didn't go on for as long as it went on at the reservoir. And that's why so many of us froze up. I froze my hands and feet and a little, lost a little, my tops of my ears were black. I lost a little piece of this one. It was probably you know, eight or nine months before I could tear a match out of a book of matches and strike it. I couldn't feel it. It was numb. But anyway, I stayed with them. Uh, there's no place to, there's no way to get you out of there. It was either as long as you could, they could, Corman kept us bandaged up and we just kept fighting. Finally back at Coterie, which is the little village just at the top of the mountain before they started back down to Hung Nam, the engineers graded out a strip in the snow and they brought in, uh, oh, they were like the old, the old Grumman Avenger dive bombers. And they could put one walking wounded in behind the pilot where an observer usually sat. And they started flying guys out. And that's how I went out. My spotter carried me out there and I got in behind that. <laughs> That pilot, we bumped off down through the snow and ice, and I thought, boy, get this thing in the air. And he got it up there and flew us down to the bottom of the mountain. And from there, we got on airplanes, and they flew us into Japan to the hospitals. But the, the reservoir of all the battles down that we were in down south, we'd been, most of us in the brigade were well seasoned by the time we got to the reservoir. We'd been through about everything down there. But man, I'm telling you, when when the Chinese came in, that was, you know, I'll never forget that as long as I live. It was, I've never seen that many people or that much carnage in my life and no value for human life. I just couldn't, I couldn't understand it. It just, I don't know, I just tried to put it out of my memory for a long, long time and I couldn't imagine how any race of people could be so fanatic to dive into the gunfire that they'd come into and and then fortunately we had good air power if the weather would clear we'd get the fighters over us strafing and, and dropping napalm and rockets and man those guys and those corsairs i've seen the time i'd i'd kiss their tails in the middle of 12th and maine give them three hours to draw a crowd because when they came over they they kept them pinned down and we, we could catch a breather you couldn't build a fire if you did, you silhouetted yourself and they'd snipe at you. It was just fighting the cold and the, the miseries of that, as well as trying to keep the weapons working. Even weapons would freeze up. A BAR, the action would get so tight that it, you guys were, everybody told us don't use any lubriplate and no oil because it just gums it up, keep it dry. And a lot of times we'd sleep with our rifles right in our bag. We wouldn't zip our bag because we didn't want to get caught in there. But I noticed in the film, your film yesterday, you could see some of that guys with the bags just kind of pulled over them kind of like a blanket. And that's the way we, we did it. One of the reasons there were so many frostbite injuries, we had the Marines were issued what was called shoe packs. And they were a leather top with a rubber bottom. It had a big old felt insole. And... It was true what the man said in the film. You you were so busy running and going and moving and climbing hills and moving around, your feet would sweat. And then you'd, if you stopped or got in a position like where you were in a firefight, those insoles would freeze right to your socks. So it was a, we didn't have the Mickey Mouse boots and the things they had later on to, and just old kid skin gloves. And, oh man, it was, I've never seen any place as cold as that was by a lot of the girl out here today said, how hot is it? I said, it can't get too hot for me. <laughs> you know, when I leave this world, if I go south, 
I, I'm going to tell Satan, turn up the heat, baby. It ain't near enough for me. But it, that chosen was a battle, I think, that will go down in, in history as one of the greatest engagements of all kind. If by anything was holy, they should have annihilated us to every man. They didn't have the air power, and they didn't have the wherewithal to stay on top of us that long. And it was just tough getting out of there. Well, you, you bring up a lot of thoughts, um, Chuck. One, one thought I have, um, you said you've never seen so much carnage, the, the, the amount of Chinese, like maggots on a canvas or carpet, what you're saying. I mean, that, that creates pictures in your mind. And I'm thinking you're a young Marine, 19 years old, you're with all these other Marines, and it's cold and beyond reason. And, and how mentally, I mean, you're, you're trained, you're prepared, but what about, let's say, the, the spiritual side of life or your faith? Did, did that help at all, or did you have faith in God? Or I mean, how, how did that get you through those times in, in yeah, seeing all that? It did. I wasn't a strong church goer, uh, I guess. I was raised as a Presbyterian, and I, as a little boy, I went to, to church with my parents, went to Sunday school, but I wasn't, you know, all that big a, a Bible packer, let's say, and a in the Marines, most all of your your uh, uh, church services in the field are with, uh, let's say, generic chaplains. You may have a Jewish rabbi in the field or a, or a Catholic priest or a Methodist minister who's in the service. And I went to a lot of, you know, uh, uh, those types of services in the field. And then later on when I, when I joined the church and studied what life is all about, where did I come from, why am I here, and where am I going when I leave this place, and I think back on that, I wasn't above prayer, neither was anybody that was with me. And there's an old saying that you don't find any atheists in a foxhole, and that's true. And there's many a time my buddy and I sat there back to back praying, and I can remember one night up there that we all belonged to an organization you've heard of, The Chosen Few, and that emblem of the chosen few is a real bright star, and you've probably heard that story. Oh, yeah. And, and anyway, we were we were praying that when daylight come, that the weather would clear enough that we could get the uh, the fighters would come in and get them off our backs, as they'd been on us for about two days. The weather had been so foul that we couldn't get air cover during daylight hours to come in. It was mountainous region, and the planes can't get down low to strafe flying around where they can't see the mountains. So we were really praying for weather to clear. And I can remember sitting in that hole with my buddy uh, that bitter cold night thinking, boy, we got to get some air power. And both of us were saying our prayers and we were saying them out loud. And then I can remember the clouds moving away and I saw that real bright star. And I just, I just knew somebody was answering our prayers. And lo and behold, the weather cleared. The fighters came in and gave us a break, and we were able to get out of that position and move on, on down the road another three or four miles before we got hit again. But, and that subsequently became the, the emblem for the chosen few. That's a good story. Uh, good story. So these engagements with the enemy, um, I mean, you're losing Marines. Were friends of yours killed or wounded? And, and again, Chuck, how do you get through that? Uh, just focused on your mission, or how do you get through How do you process all that? Well, Larry, I don't really know how to answer that. It's, you know, the first, uh, the first few of your friends that are killed is pretty tough to take. It's all tough to take, but it's, it, it it just becomes a part of the daily activity, and you, you, you see it happen, and sometimes it happens so quickly, sometimes it was longer and drawn out, but I've had good friends killed on both sides of me. I had one of my spotters hit right next to me. Um, you, just, you just don't know. It's, as I go to reunions now, there's only about 18 of us left out of my company, and uh, I've been since I joined the VFW, I belonged to an honor platoon, and we, we bury the dead. 
And you mentioned yesterday, I think, national figures are somewhere between 1,200 and 1,500 a day nationally for World War One, World War Two, and Korean vets dropping away because all of us are getting on up there now. And I go to those military funerals, and those guys, you know, I've buried a lot of them. I don't know who they are, but I know what they did. And we're, we're a band of brothers. So, you know, a lot of... A lot of people say, how can you stand to go to those funerals all the time? I said, well, I consider it a, an honor to give military funeral honors to, to a fellow serviceman that had, had been there and helped defend his country. And uh, I guess in the last six, eight years, we're, our post is up around 800 funerals now. So, but it, to answer your question, when the action is going on and people are getting hit, things are happening so fast, the adrenaline is pumping, uh, you just kind of become seasoned to it, I guess, and uh, there's just no dodging it or getting away from it. And then you, the next thing you do, there's the human body builds within our minds the ability to shut a door and try to close it out. And so many, many guys have done that. I know even today, one of uh, one of our gunners is a is a Navajo Indian, and he still won't hardly talk, even when we're together, just talking about things. And it's it's just, his wife told me she says he never says a word about it. It's uh, you slam that door and try and put it out of your out of your thoughts, and eventually you come back home and things are good. And you know we live in the greatest country in the world, and. 22 years in the military, I traveled to a lot of places, and I've been in a lot of countries. I've been back to Korea three different times, been back to some of the combat positions, went back down to the Naktong, and even found some of the old gun pits that we'd been in and dug around in. And it's, you know, you never forget it. It's the bad, there were, there were times it was kind of neat when they'd put us down south one day, they pulled us out of the line, we all went swimming in the Miriang River, and I can remember Maggie Higgins driving across the bridge, she was, Marguerite Higgins was over there, <laughs> she was waving at us, we're all these guys out there in the middle of the river swimming and soaping up. And you think about things like that, and you, you know, you, I found myself when I came back, I was kind of a finicky eater, I wasn't after that, and it, uh, things today, uh, I thought I'd never go back where it was cold. When when I retired, we moved to Colorado and lived on the top of a mountain out on the west slope, a place where, called where? Arrowhead. Yep, about I live in Grand Junction, Colorado. Oh, you're close. Yeah. You're yeah, real close. Wow. We lived, uh, well, you know where Montrose is. Of course. Just about in Cimarron's around the corner from the Black Canyon, right straight up in the mountains is a place called Arrowhead. And you had a home up there? Built a home up there, Did lived there. It? Did you sell it? Well, I tried to hang on to it. I figured I'd go back out. But the price is the, what we had was a circular acre, and Jim Squirrel's ranch developed it. It was the neatest place you ever saw. If you ever get a chance when you're out there, go up there. Anyway, we lived there about eight years, summer and winter. And, of course, up in the mountain, it wasn't near as cold as it was in Gunnison. We lived halfway between Gunnison and Montrose. It was 30 miles to each one. And we'd go down to Gunnison for the snowmobile races. But... I thought I'd, that's what I started to say, I thought I'd never move back where it was cold. But we lived up there, and as long as I wore Sorrel boots and snowmobile gear, you know, gosh, I didn't, I enjoyed it. It was good fishing, good elk hunting, and I just enjoyed the isolation and the beauty of the mountains and to, to see the animals and trap three bear while I was up there and had a good time. I didn't know you were from Grand Junction. Yes, yeah. 40 years there. Yeah, my gosh. You know, gosh. Really the area you're describing, so. I belong to, I got to fly in radio control model planes. Cool. And I belonged to the Grand Junction Modeliers, and we had a, a strip up on Whitewater Hill, back out, you know where, you know where that is. Of course. <laughs> so. Uh, so how long ago was that? We moved, uh, built the house in 83. We moved out there in first very first part of 87, and stayed until 90, 95, and then we moved, came back here. But I was on the on the board out there. I was vice president of the board, which is like city council here, and uh, watched it grow from 22 families that wintered up there. Got a lot of people live there, but they have chateaus in France and summer home in Colorado. And now, we, our all our roads were just mud, 
now they're gravel. We got phones up there. So it was fun. I really enjoyed it. It wasn't, you know, it's not just for everybody. I had to cut and bust about eight, ten cords of wood a year to, to heat the house. And yeah. I had a propane furnace for backup. But, wow. yeah, it was really nice. And so much, so much, you know, the southwestern part of Colorado has more 14,000 peaks than any other part. If you go down toward Ure and and down into Silverton and, and, and that direction, and boy, I tell you, those San Juans are oh, gorgeous yeah. down there. You can't yeah. see it. I used to ski a lot, so I was in the mountains a lot. But, um, maybe we'll talk about that more later. That's okay. interesting to me. But um, you're, you're, you're doing great. Your description of Korea so far is one of the best I've heard, so I'm, I appreciate that. Um, how, how did the war change you? I mean, before, during, or after, how did it change you as a person? Well, I'm, I'm, I know it made me more thankful for the things I have, for it, it increased, you know, I was always, I grew up during World War II and looked up to all the guys that fought in that. I had a, a cousin that flew with Boynton, and I was just a little bit too young to, to get caught up in World War II, and I went in in 48, and because he was a Marine pilot and I wanted to go in the Marines. And I, I was always patriotic, but I think the war has increased that. Uh, flag flies in front of my house 24-7. And I'm always, you know, careful. I go out and buy new ones. I don't let the flag get worn. I keep a light on it. Um, it just, I'm like most guys my age. When I go to a baseball game and they're standing there singing or talking when the national anthem's playing, that makes me sore. And... You know, it used to be wherever those stars and stripes were flying, it was respected the world over. And it's not that way anymore. And we've lost a lot, I think, in this country of a desire to produce good quality, not only in products that we, we build and manufacture, but good quality in our families. And I think the kinds of things I learned and the hardships of, of battle and combat have helped me be a better dad, uh, be a better person. I became interested in, in public service and kind of got into some, you know, small time, I call it cornstalk aristocracy politics. But I served on city council out in Colorado and then when we came back here, I served on the council six years and I was mayor for two terms and I, I enjoy giving back to the community that I live in. I participate actively in, in affairs of the VFW and the Legion. Uh, I was a scout leader for a number of years trying to teach some of the things that I learned that would help young boys. I still work with the scouts in our church, not as active as, a, you know, I spent my time camping out and <laughs> sleeping on the ground, but I still enjoy sitting down and talking with them. I enjoy going to the schools that are studying uh, the military, the military science classes in the, the Korean War, World War II, and taking along some relics and stuff and explaining to them what it's all about. The youngsters don't really understand it. It's, it's sort of like trying to tell kids today about the Depression. They don't understand that either. And, but, you know, it's very vivid in, in the minds of guys my age that were there and all of all of my buddies that are still in the in the, our military reunions, they all feel the same way. It the war has a way of never leaving you, but yet in some ways it's it's been helpful to a lot of guys. I think a lot of guys maybe got so much reacted in the wrong way, maybe and became alcoholics or things. It never affected me that way, but. That isn't the only thing to do, and I've seen athletes do the same thing. So it's, you know, it's it's just, it'd be great if everybody in this world could live in, in peace. I've got a grandson right now that's in the Marines. He's a crew chief on a C-130, been over to Afghanistan, and I told him, whatever you do, and you go in, don't be a grunt, get, get in the air wing, or get a place where it's a little bit safer. But the things... When I go out to Camp Pendleton and visit with these young Marines that are coming back from the ground pounders that are over there, and I hear the stories they're telling, and I'm thinking, you know, this isn't, this isn't the kind of war we fought. And you're not taking any objectives. You're not, you know, they're, they're, 
we got young men and women over there getting killed by people that aren't even in uniform, that have got a bomb strapped around their middle that they get in the middle of you and cut it loose, you don't even know who your enemies are. And these young kids will sit around in the barracks and talk, and, and uh, they tell me, you know, gunnies, I, I visit with the snipers quite a bit, and they said, man, we've had some of those towel heads right in our sights, but we can't shoot them if they're in a hospital, if they're in a government building, if they're in a mosque, we can't return fire into any of those kind of... And I'm thinking, what kind of war is this? I mean, are we there just... To, you know, I keep wondering, are we really going to be able to teach these people democracy and what it's all about when it's never been a way of their life? Mm -hmm. And that's what, you know, what runs through my mind and the mind of a... A lot of other old-time veterans like me, I'm sure, think the same thing. But it's necessary, I guess, to be there. When I ask, I ask them straight out, do you think we need to be there? What's your opinion? You've been over on a couple of kicks in country. Yep, we need to be there. We're doing some good. Well, okay. I'll buy what they tell me. But, you know, and I, I suppose Korea was, the battles in Korea were more closely thought like World War II. Objectives were laid out and that's what you took and you'd move up and that began to change in Vietnam. I mean, they'd, they'd load up a chopper and fly you into a hot DMZ and you'd battle around in there for two or three days and load you up and move somewhere else and the position would be run over by VC again. So it's, uh, you know, warfare has changed. The stuff they've got today if we'd had some of the weapons that this country has now with us in the reservoir, it would have been a whole lot better. But, you know, it's, uh, I'm glad to see people like you preserving these historical things. My, my wife was telling me the other day, she said, some of this stuff you've got, you need to, to you know, my son, I don't think wants some of that junk I brought home, but I've, I think I've got every history book that's been written about the Korean War. I'm reading a new one now. And I almost got a miniature library on Korea. Okay. And I'm thinking of going here to uh, donating this stuff to uh, uh, the gentleman that was that spoke to us yesterday from... Uh, Graceland? Graceland. Mm -hmm. That's right around the corner here in Kansas City. The Independence Area is kind of known as a Korean War That's historical like here. Mm -hmm. You mentioned fighting before the Chosen. Were you fighting the North Koreans at all? Yes. Can there you were... compare their soldiers to the Chinese? Yeah, the North Koreans were, the ones we fought, were I, not all that good of troops. Most of them were young kids like we were. Uh, they were all equipped with Russian weapons and used more or less Russian tactics, which are mass tactics, very little envelopment or or flanking movements or anything like that. They were masters at camouflage and cover and concealment. But once you maintain fire superiority, they would break ranks and move, and then you'd have to go like heck to catch up with them again. The Chinese, on the other hand, the ones we ran into in the reservoir, there were a lot of Manchurian troops in there. And these weren't little Asian, some of these guys were big. They were big men with leathery faces and wrinkles. You can tell they'd grown up in the in the rough Manchurian weather and and were, were tough troops, a lot of hardship. They had quilted uniforms. They were kind of mustard brown on one side and kind of off-white on the other. If they had a patch of snow to cross that was 20 feet, they'd turn that jacket around white side out to cross. They were very good at cover and concealment, and they'd hide out in the daytime. You couldn't, it was difficult to find them. And then they, most of their their attacks were at night, so where they could use darkness to move, because the air power, we didn't have our air power at night, and they knew that. And it was all their signal. They didn't have radios and communications like we had, walkie-talkies or double E8 crank phones or anything like that. They were all all uh, whistle signals, bugle signals. They had a lot of bugles. A lot of the Marines picked those bugles up for souvenirs, you know, and had them. Another thing that they had 
that I didn't hear it mentioned yesterday, many, many of the U.S. Thompson machine guns were in their hands. When the U.S. Uh, surplused those out, they surplused a lot of them to Chiang Kai-shek's army. And as his troops were captured, they also captured those weapons. So we started running into all these Chinese with Thompsons. Some of them had the drum magazine and some the stick magazine. And the Thompson is a 45 caliber weapon. It's, it's not good for distance, but in close, you can spray a lot of lead with that thing. And we thought, man, this is, you know, getting shot with our own weapons here. But as far as the, the capacity of the troops, those, those Chinese were fearless. They're either fearless or fanatic. I don't know what the, what the word would be. If, if I was getting slaughtered that hard, man, I, I'd fire and fall back. But they, they just kept coming until somebody blew a bugle or a whistle, and then they'd retreat back into the darkness. But the big difference between the two, nowadays, in the last two times I've been to Korea and talked with some of the, the rock, Korean rock marines, uh, visited their bases, they're trained, and of course they're, they've got good weapons now, the United States has supplied them and a lot. And it's such a strange feeling for me to go up to that DMZ and climb up in that tower at Freedom Village and look across at North Korean troops staring at me thinking these are probably the grandsons of some of them I fought against. First time we went back was 1975, and that was, you know, that was, well, we made the invasion in, in 1950. That was 25 years after the war. Yeah. And still staring across a no man's land. And uh, I don't know, it's just, of course, 38th parallel was there when I, when I was there, but I was evacuated before all of the, arm, the uh, ceasefire talks. They took us into uh, the MAC building when we went up there, had our wives with us, and the, the troops that were assigned to us to take us around the DMZ, they said, now these people know you're here. They're reading about you every day in the paper. They see your caps with your marine emblems. They know who you are. So don't go pointing at any of them. Don't do things like that because some of the negotiations are going on and they're going to say, well, they made obscene gestures at us or they flipped us off or something. So be very careful of what you do and what you say. Well, when we went in the MAC building, that's the Military Armistice Commission building, sets right across the 38th parallel. And right down the center of that building is this great big table with a green uh, cloth on it and the microphone cords run right down the center, right along the DMZ. And this lieutenant that took us in, he said, now, the the... UN forces sat there and the, the North Koreans were here. And if you come over on this side of the room, you can say you've been in North Korea. So a lot of us walked over there. And he said the first, the first meeting, the Americans had a little red flag that they, they're the UN flag. So the next day, the Korean contingent, when they met, they had a North Korean flag. And these flags just kept getting bigger every day until they had the fringe around them. So it was a kind of a one-upsmanship thing. The troops that serve there all have to be six foot or better at Camp Tiger. Wow. And, uh, you know, it's, Korea is a beautiful, South Korea is wonderful. But North Korea, the pictures I've seen of it from... National Geographic, if you see those satellite pictures at night, the whole you can just tell right where the parallel is with the lights of the south and the top is dark. They took us down in the tunnels that had been dug under the mountains uh, you, where our troops had machine gun nests set up. And I'm thinking, good gosh, all these years and the war still, you're still sitting there looking down a gun barrel. You're just not shooting at anybody, you know. Makes you wonder, makes you think. Well, that's amazing. What you've described now, you were wounded a second time, was that right? I got hit August 7th yeah, with just some shrapnel, and I stayed. My company corpsman kept us patched up. We, David Douglas Duncan came up, and there was a life photographer that took a bunch of our pictures. And I was with the first 13 guys, I guess, that got first 13 Marines that got hit in Korea. And I had a bandage on the side of my face, a little piece went through knocked a chip off my tooth, one in my arm, and just minor stuff. And the corpsman kept me patched up. But I, all those guys that they tagged, 
Of course, it was scared half to death. None of us knew what was going on. Those shells were busting, and your baptism of fire is the worst time. Oh, man, my heart was right in my mouth. But if I'd, have, if I'd have just kept that tag on and hadn't been so scared, I'd have come right back to Japan, got patched up and been shipped on back to the States. Everybody else got back to the States. I wanted to get back with the guys I knew. I felt safe with them. When I heard them saddling up outside this little old schoolhouse where they had us laying on stretchers, I jumped up and bailed out the window and got back, and our corpsman kept me patched up. And then I got hit three days in from Inchon, about the 18th of September, uh, I got uh, caught with a sniper around, and then up in the reservoir I got a little bit more sh shrapnel, just small stuff, and, but basically what shut me down up there, I froze my hands and my, my feet. I couldn't feel nothing, and so that's the main reason I, I got out of there. So now you got to tell me for a minute, you mentioned your baptism under fire. I mean, two questions. Do you feel invincible as a young Marine at times, like nothing can happen? And then you went through what you call the baptism of fire. Explain that process. <clears throat> well, in your training, you're taught, you know, and, and, and that's true. If you're trained properly, you're going to be able to control your emotions better. And the discipline that the Marine Corps has and the esprit de corps that we have, I think, you know, they say there's no such thing as an ex-Marine. We're all former Marines. And it's, it's just the training and all of that, it seems like, in my mind, that's what helps. You don't really feel invincible. You know you can be, you can be hit and you can be killed. But because of what you've been taught and how you've been trained, you just, you just keep toting that barge and lifting that bale. And, and it's the whole unit sticking together. And you go through the baptism of fire, and uh, boy, the first one is rough on anybody, and all of our veterans told us that, you know, all these, our officers, and uh, that morning of that mortar barrage, why, I can remember the gunny saying, well, now you've been through it, you know, what's coming? And then when you hear the bullet pop, that's the one that's close. When you hear them zip, don't worry about them, they're long gone, you know. And those guys would give us a lot of, of good pointers and things that, to keep yourself safe, and that you you know that you can only learn on the battlefield, you know, and so after that it just sort of becomes automatic, and then no campaign is really what you would say a learning experience, but they they in some ways they really are. You you get through a lot of it with with just plain old ordinary life. We had one big gunnery sergeant at Easy Company. Gunny Barnett, they called him Barkin Barney. I've seen him stand up with more bullets flying around him and never he never got a scratch. <laughs> I thought, how could he do it? It just didn't bother him. And it's, uh, I don't know, it's a strange thing to try to explain to somebody what it's like being shot at, you know. It's, but when you, when you see people bothered me for a long time that some of those guys I know I killed were young kids like me and you know I'm sure they had family somewhere in Korea or China or wherever it was and that bothered me for a long time. I talked to my my church bishop not too long ago about that. It still bothers me and you know I, I don't think anybody likes to say well I I killed somebody or I, I had some target acquisitions that were witnessed and eliminated, but that, that's just part of it. Vietnam played a lot of, you know, body count was a main big deal over there. And I don't know, it's, if anybody would ever see war or participate in one, they never want one. I mean, what the heck do they really solve? They're just, it's, Prehistoric to me to think of taking life and so you felt remorse, guilt, and then did this bishop help you? I mean, this re recent occasion, or how'd that how how'd that go? Oh yeah, if uh, yeah, I believe you know that our heavenly Father created each of us, and regardless of whether we're Chinese or. Korean or black or white or red or green, we are human beings. 
and we're created in his likeness and you know we should try to live our lives and and in such a way that we can return to live with him someday and live honorably and live faithfully to the covenants we make with him and and I you know I kept thinking gee whiz well what about guys like us that were forced into something we really didn't know what we were getting into and we had to take <coughs> lives and do some awful cruel almost inhuman things and how will our how will our savior look upon us for that and but if you if you read the bible and study the scriptures why you know biblical times were pretty tough too there was always wars and everything going on and it's just i don't know it just creates a feeling in you that maybe you you i don't know of unworthiness and there's times you need a little bit of stimulation from somebody to to tell you, well, you know, that's no church in our in our country and in, in the land beholds or holds anything against a person that was in the service for doing what they had to do. And and, and I don't know of any any of the men I served with. I've I've never heard any of them say that they felt good about taken a life. I mean, you, you, it was just something that had to be done. Uh, police I served as a, for a while as a police officer, and there's times in there that you have to make some pretty tough arrests on people, and you don't like to do that either, to have to take somebody to jail because they were drunk and maybe assaulted somebody, or, or go into a home and break up a family beef and take the husband off to jail to dry out for a few. That's not fun either. So in, in a sense, it's, it's just about being a good human being and living our lives like we're supposed to live them and do it in such a way that uh, we can live in peace. And it seems like it's always, there's, well, ever since I've been alive, <laughs> you know, I, I grew up in the 30s in the Depression and all through World War II and then boom, right after that, here comes Korea and then Vietnam and now we're Afghanistan, and and then I even brought it over to New York on on uh, 911, and you wonder why in the world can people get along and live together and work together and and make our our lives happy instead of you know there's a lot of things in this world of ours that could be improved. People are hungry and starving in a lot of places and. Uh, we've we've done some great things with disease, whipped a lot of terrible crippling diseases, and why can't we work together? You know, as a world, and, and I would think if if I was able to sit down with some of those Chinese that I fought against, guys that are my age now, and sit down with some of the North Koreans that I fought against, and some of the Japanese that the Marines fought against, I think they'd all agree. You know. All of this stuff we went through on both sides, the suffering and the killing, that doesn't need to be there to to live happy lives. And it's uh, it's just a shame that people have to go through it. And once you do, you don't you never forget it. And it's through people like you that have that have recorded these these different stories from the guys. I think. Uh, I noticed there were a lot of tears flowing yesterday there, and I was one of them. And as I, you know, every time I see something like that, I think, my gosh, that was. And I still, every now and then, wake up with a bad dream, you know, and never, never really leaves you. And it, it makes it makes a deep impression upon, I think, upon everybody. So. Why is it referred to as? Uh, somebody even said ignored, but forgotten war. Why do you think that is? Well, it's been, Korea has often been called a forgotten war, and I, you know, it, in the first place, it wasn't really when it started out, it wasn't really a war. Uh, it was called a police action, and I can remember on the side of the water jacket of our of our heavy thirty machine gun, we took white paint and painted Harry's police pistol. He called it a police action. Now I've walked here in the square with Harry when when I came back. He he'd walk all around town, visit with everybody. And I've sat in a lodge with him. 
And I often, I kidded him, not often, I kidded him one time about that and told him, he laughed when I told him that we had put that on the side of our gun. But I, I respect him for some of the tremendous decisions that he had to make as a president. He was, you know, he held every office from precinct to president. And uh, gosh, went in right after Roosevelt died of a cerebral hemorrhage and right into the end of World War II and then Korea come along. He, he had, you know, he, it was his decision to drop the bomb. And think how awesome that had to be. And, but he knew that if we had to go into the island of Japan to take it, we'd lose, you know, a quarter million troops. So that happened. And, you know, I think about those decisions. I think about MacArthur when he fired him and why he did. And uh, the Marines really had it tough under 10th Corps command. We were under a guy named Ned Almond who was a general under, and he was, he was something, a Ridgeway's a good man. And I FO'd for the 2nd Infantry Division, the Indian Head Division, and great bunch of guys. But that Ned Allman, he, you know, and MacArthur was a prima donna in my mind. The morning he came up to Kempo when we had had that big firefight up there and his, his convoy come roaring up the road and our gunny said, hey, here comes Big Mac. And he had on that hat with the scrambled eggs and sitting in the front of that Jeep. And one of his aides, a lieutenant, was standing there next to Gunny McVeigh. And this guy's all in starched khaki right from Japan. And he's looking at all this carnage and six tanks burning and, and North Koreans laying all over the place. And there was a culvert pipe that ran under the road and some Marine come out from under there with a couple of them you know, to the point of his gun. And MacArthur's looking at all this. And this lieutenant told our gunner, he said, you damn Marines seem to always stage everything to your advantage. Like we'd done all of that to set it all up, you know. Gosh, I, Gunny, he, Gunny just looked at him. MacArthur turned the convoy around and he hit it by. It was the only time I ever saw him. But I, I guess what hurt most of the Marines that were up in the Chosen Reservoir was the fact that we kept running into them and their intelligence, MacArthur's intelligence was telling him what we were hitting, but nobody wanted to believe it. You know, and the statement was made, well, you're not gonna let a few Chinese laundrymen stop you, are you? Well, it was more than a few Chinese laundrymen. <laughs> and that always bothered me. I thought, well, you know, MacArthur was a brilliant tactician. The Inchon invasion was something that was just to take all those warships up that channel and a, into a harbor with a 33-foot tide. That's the reason we had to hit the beach at 6 o'clock at night to take advantage of that high tide. The next morning, there were destroyers sitting high and dry in the mud out there. And, you know, that... John, tell me, we're running out of time, but tell yeah. me what the American flag means and it represents to you as a veteran. Well, American flag represents my country. And there's a, a thing I say when I'm at a funeral and I'm having the flag folded and I present it to the next of kin. As it's being folded, I recite a, a little thing that says, this banner of love and devotion now being folded is a living memorial to the faithfulness of our comrade, the one that you have come to honor here this day. The blue field represents the sky above and denotes the watchfulness of God the Eternal. The red stripes, they tell us of the blood, sweat, and tears offered and the seen and unseen enemies conquered by our comrade because of his duties and responsibilities to this great nation. The white stripes tell us of the peace that he has helped bring our future generations. This is his flag but it's our spiritual heritage. Please receive it with the proud tears of our mind and the unyielding faith of our hearts. And I guess that, to me, is what the American flag means to me. That's very good. How about freedom? What does freedom mean to you? And tell me about the price to protect our freedoms. 
Well, freedom, you know, everybody says freedom isn't free, and it certainly isn't. Um, when you have lived in other countries or have you you've traveled and visited other countries and you see the f some of the freedoms that they don't have that we do, you know, we, we're the Americans are kind of the toughest people on their own country. We really bad mouth it and uh, give everybody heck, the politicians, everybody, but we live in the best country in this world. All you gotta do is travel around some or fight a few battles and, and feel how great it is to come home to American soil. We have freedom of speech, freedom to worship as we please. Uh, sure, we get upset because of high gas prices and all the different things that go on, but we still live in the greatest country in the world. And to this, this nation has been paid for and the freedoms we enjoy have been have been paid for by so many men and women who have throughout history defended her and made her the country she is. And I'm proud to be an American and to live here and to support her in any way that I can and to try and live my life as I can to, to be a good person. And you're obviously proud to be a Korea War veteran? Oh, you bet. <laughs> Yes, sir. I sure am. Proud to have served my country, uh, both in peace and war. I didn't, I was still in when Vietnam come along, but the Marine Corps had a, a rule if you had two Purple Hearts and were a sole surviving son, you didn't have to, didn't have to go. So I lucked out. I didn't have to go to, to Vietnam. I would have gone if, and if, if, you know, I'd been told to go. I, but I, I enjoyed my career in military service and and my retirement from it, and military taught me a lot, and I'm grateful for those things that I did learn for it, and I'm, I'm grateful to say, like old Patton said, you know, if you follow me, boys, you won't have to, when your grandson crawls up on your knee and say, Daddy, what'd you do in the war? You, you won't have to say, well, I didn't shovel shit in Alabama. So, <laughs> I was there, I'd done that, I saw the worst of it, and, uh, I guess I'm happy that I made it back and I've been able to use some of the bad things I, I saw to help make me a better person, I hope. Did you ever get to help any of the wounded at all or was the corpsman just doing that? Do you remember any incidents where you helped the wounded? Oh yeah, yeah, I helped bandage some guys. Uh, I told you about my spot, one of my spotters got hit right next to me and had a pretty bad wound in his throat and I helped patch him. I mean, all of us did that. We were, we helped with one another. Somebody got, you know, knocked down beside. One day we had to clean out a house with a sniper down near Sewell and uh, one of the guys in my platoon caught a piece of shrapnel from a grenade and he, he was a big heavy set guy and had a piece in his, in the fat of his abdomen and we dug that out and put a bandage on it and Corman wasn't even with us that day. But yeah, everybody pitched in and helped, just like you're on a Boy Scout camp out and one of the kids gets hurt, you try to patch them up and, and get them help. And most of the time it was the corpsman though that was out there with, with his tail in the air and his head down working on the story of the surrettes in their mouth was true. It's the only way they could keep them thawed out. They'd, and our, our guy's name was Chip. His last name was Chipman. He was a Navy corpsman, stayed right with us. Uh, he loved to come up there and try and crank off a shot or two when he could, when he could do it when nobody was being hurt. And a lot of times he'd go up on the hills with me, and and then he latched onto a. Most of the corpsmen carried a 45, but he latched onto a carbine somewhere, and he always had that with him. And if he had a chance to get off a shot, he was wasn't opposed to getting up there cranking them off with you. And what a great guy! And. Saved a lot of lives, I know. Stopped a lot of serious bleeding, got them bandaged up where they could get them pulled back to a, a unit where they get get better taken care of. And that was just automatic. That was nothing more than a father would do with their kids if they got hurt. And when your buddies got hit on the right or left of you, if it was, you know, minor wounds, you tried to do what you could for them. And uh, plasma was froze for the most part when we were in the reservoir. You couldn't couldn't hardly use it. And there were times at the 
aid station right down below us that the less critical wounded were laid outside the tents and then they'd, they'd rotate them in and out and they'd even assign healthy guys to move some of those poor guys into a warming tent before the doctors could even get a chance to work on them and they're still laying out there in the cold. They're just, you just couldn't get away from that cold. There just wasn't any place to get away from it. And that was a, that was a bitter thing about that that whole campaign was that cold weather. Boy, it was that was the coldest place I ever saw in my life. But why did you survive? <laughs> Lord's will, I guess. It's you know there was many a time that you know I knew I was in the guy's crosshairs, but just Lord had something else He wanted me to do somewhere in my life and. So I'm sure that's, you know, when, when it's your time to go, he's going to pull the plug and you, you don't have to worry about it. And that's what I always, it takes you a little bit to learn that, I think, in combat. But once I figured that out, why well, it helps remove a lot of that fear and apprehension that you have. One last thing, we're almost out of tape. You saw at the end of my film, I had the guy salute for mm -hmm. me. From where you're seated, when I tell you, can you give me a salute? Sure. Okay, Chuck, right into the camera. Go ahead. Excellent. Okay. All right. Wonderful. Stay there. I'm going to take a picture of us with my other camera here. Okay.